Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're tuning in to this from. Welcome to our Friday workflow webinars. The topic this week is broadcasting from home. Uh, this has been an, a really a new foray for a lot of productions these days, given the current COVID situation. So everybody's learning new ways to do production. And a lot of that involves people in their separate places. So we're going to talk with a few awesome engineers here about that. Just for quick introductions, my name is Jen Liang Shabu. I'm part of our artist and entertainment relations team. Brian Smith is here from our artist relations team as well. And Ben Escobedo from our market development team. Also, you'll see him later, Jason Waffle, also from our market development team. So let's talk about our guests that we have coming through. So we have three great guests from the industry that are making this work right now. We have Tom Davis, who is an audio producer, Jody Elf, who is a recording and broadcast engineer, and Mark Wiglinski, who's uh, actually right now he's uh, a wanting uh, GMA. So they're going to talk a bit about the things that they're doing right now. Quick housekeeping thing. We like to answer questions as we go along. So there is a questions area for those of you tuning in. Go ahead and throw your questions in there and we will do our best to address them as we go through this webinar. So let's kick it off. Ryan Smith is going to start and we're gonna talk a little bit more with Tom Davis about some of his recent productions. Awesome, thanks Jen, appreciate it. And thanks to everyone, uh, our panelists today for joining us. Yeah, Tom, I wanted to dig into a recent show that you were enlisted to, to help put together as far as your audio producer skills. And uh, I wanted to talk specifically about CMT Celebrate Our Heroes. And it's a situation where everybody's at home and CMT wanted you to help out with an audio solution to send to them to produce this broadcast. Can you talk a little bit about how that show came together? Yeah, I'll give you a quick backstory. <clears throat> when this whole pandemic hit, we were actually, uh, the first CMT show we did was for a Kenny Rogers tribute, which happened very quickly right after his death. And of course it was a mad scramble and with everybody locked at home, they just said, hey, send us in stuff, shoot on your iPhone, whatever. Uh, so there was no real discussion about trying to control that. Uh, kudos to CMT for when we got that stuff, how ratty some of it was. So when the next Celebrating Our Heroes came up, we had several conversations, emails, Zoom calls, saying, what do we do? How can we fix this a little bit, uh, fix this problem? And I came up with the first thing I mentioned was, if people are going to be recording something at home, uh, the VP88. I mean, I've used them forever. And everybody I know that has used this thing has had nothing but great things to say about it. It just sounds great. Uh, and Ryan, you're the one that turned me on to that, that mic by showing me some of the clips that you've done. So we started to put together a, a, a kit to send out to the artists that was more than just audio. Of course, we had, uh, where they actually, they, they decided to buy a bunch of iPhones rather than use some Canon cameras or something because nobody's afraid of a smartphone and everybody knows how to use them. They put an app on it where they could upload the stuff after they shot it. And we sent the whole kit with a, with lights and uh, tripods and the VP88s and some miscellaneous other things. Is that the MV88? MV, sorry. MV88. No worries. And then we wrote up a big uh, instruction kit, basic instruction book, basically. Um, Ran it all through uh, the shipping was all ran through Morris Light and Sound, who were gracious enough to offer to do that to keep everything clean. So they would wipe everything down and disinfect, and repackage, whatnot. So they actually laminated our our instruction book. Because one of the things that I convinced them of is, you know, it's it's not just the gear that you use, but it's the expertise. So not only did we send them the mics. Uh, with how to use them, but on the day that, uh, and again, this was part of the, the workflow, which really helped as opposed to saying, well, hey, Darius, will you shoot us a thing, you know, and send it to us? No, we scheduled it just like we schedule any show. I said, what day can you do it? What time can you do it? Where will you be? 
okay, we're going to connect on to you with a Zoom call to help you get it all going. And most artists were really great at this. They enjoyed it. And uh, and I can't tell you how many of them. Darius said it. The brothers Osborne said it about how much respect they have for us, you know, us crew people <laughs> happen to do all this themselves, right? But they kind of had a fun time doing it. And then we would have them do a quick test, send it up to us, and uh, we'd listen and, and look and say, well, can you be a little bit closer? You know, do you have a curtain you can pull? All those kind of things. So what was great about using the, uh, the MVADA, <laughs> right? Okay. That's um, correct. I have one right here. It's right here. Um, first of all, they're really slick, <clears throat> and they plug right in, and they have the little windsock, although I don't think anybody did anything outside. But uh, and it has a little green light comes on, you know. So uh, that was our instruction. It's like, well, plug, launch a camera, plug it in. If you see a little green light, you're ready to go. We didn't, we didn't mess with the app this time uh, because the thing actually works right without it. Um, because we didn't want to overwhelm people and and, uh, and 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 get them, you know, overly taxed with doing stuff. And I was very pleased because you just plug it in, you know, it sounded great. And and then yes, being a posted show, uh, I would I would pull the stuff down, take a listen. Put a little EQ on it, you know. Maybe take a little rumble out, put some compression on it, uh, and it was and it was wonderful. Uh, and guys like the Brothers Osborne uh, were so cooperative because again, there was two guitars and two vocals, <clears throat> and they would listen to us and we'd say, you know, John, maybe can you play just a little softer or can TJ sing a little louder? You know, it's like the balance is just. And they're like, oh yeah, sure, 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 and they do another test for us. <clears throat> so it was a, it was a great success. And uh, I don't know how many of these we got back because everybody kept saying, can we have this money? You know, so I, I don't know. CMT bought them, so I don't know. But yeah, it was it was pretty encouraging. And what I've noticed, um, just on television, just watching some of these shows, the bar has been raised. And I'm not going to take credit for that. But I think that enough people have seen it at home be pretty nice and some great and some pretty ratty. So, uh, They've all gotten a little more in tune to this, you know, yeah. uh, to try and make this effort. So, so this mic was a huge, huge part of making that happen. It's been really great. For those listening, I just shared a couple of links from the videos uh, on YouTube from uh, Brothers Osborne and Darius Rucker's performances from that show where they were using the MV88. Do you recall others who were using the MV88 as well on that broadcast? Uh, oh, boy. Name some that were on it. Um, was Miranda Lambert? Was she using that? Miranda used it. Okay, Although hers, cool. hers honestly could have been better because she did it on our porch and oh. with a wide shot, so it was a little noisy and we could only do so much with it. But it still it had a nice stereo feel. It was nice. <clears throat> uh, Miranda used it. Uh, I was thinking Kelsey used it, but her performance actually was through her home studio. Although she sang in a SM7. SM7. A lot of people did. I think you saw uh, uh, Flora George Line using SM7. Yep. Luke Combs. Uh, Who else? Luke Combs. Yeah. Luke Combs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so talk about the, you know, all of those uh, tracks coming in from people and how did you manage the balance so it was, as far as that was concerned? Well, basically, you know, level wise, they were all really consistent. And I was really surprised. There was no overloading, uh, no distortion, anything like that. It was mostly about, again, for a broadcast show, you always want to try and get everything kind of in the same realm. Uh, uh, so there was a few of them that I ran them through some isotope stuff, you know, to, to maybe pull the noise down a little bit. Uh, I did use deep reverb on a couple. In fact, I think I, hmm, I use that on because it was a little boomy sounding. Uh, but, you know, but not much, you know, as like I said, that the, the biggest thing where they like garbage in, garbage out. The, the biggest thing that I'll give CMT is they really, really organized us being involved. And that really, really helped. Um, so and, and, and being willing to spend the four grand they spent on buying stuff and putting little Pelican cases together and sending them out to people. Uh, fortunately, they were all uh, most of them were right here in town. So it was just a courier. Um, but, uh, 
but yeah, I mean, that was kind of it, man. You know, and then I then I did the final mix on the whole show, the final post mix. But I pre-tweaked all these things from home, from my home studio, which I said I'd never have, um, which was great because people were willing to redo things if they, you know, they wanted it to be as best it could be. So uh, I would tweak it up in my house and go, yeah, this is fine. Or, hmm, do we still have them? Could they try it again? As well as just being on with them with the Zoom in real time uh, to be able to upload a test to us. And I'd pull it down and run it through my you know, my studio speakers and throw some plugs in it and go, yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, so that's how, how, how that went down. And uh, for the people that were using SM7s or other various mics, are those pretty much what they owned at home? Or were there any yeah. suggestions? Yeah, okay. As, as far as I know, because, you know, almost everybody has some sort of a rig at home now. Uh, right. So some of the big produced performances, like Florida Georgia Lines, I just got a T-Mix from them, you know. And it was fine. And they did send me uh, their their introduction chats on their own because they were using the SM7s as well. And uh, being all set up and tweaked for a vocal performance, uh, it was a little heavy duty for somebody just speaking, you know. So they sent me those so I could just kind of thin it out a little bit and make it sound a little more natural. Plus, it was so close. Uh, I put a little room on it so it sounded a little more natural. And that way it would blend into the performance a little nicer. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot to do with that because <clears throat> they were all pretty self-contained. Yeah. So I was pleased to see so many SM7s. I mean, they've become a go-to vocal mic in this town. Well, a lot of people yeah. are using it. Taylor's been using it since day one, I think. Taylor Swift. Yeah. Awesome. Um, honor, honor, we still have this on the screen here. Some of the, uh, suggestions you sent out to the artists here talk about this there was a, a pretty substantial package you had to send out to everyone can you talk a little bit more about that yeah um we put and we, like i said we put it all on a cheat sheet we spent a lot of time put this together and then they took my piece which this is some an excerpt from and i actually took photos and the whole thing and said this is what it looks like this is the windsaw you know when it goes here you don't need it unless you're outside and it's windy um, things like that, and, uh, uh, and, and, and along with their light kit and all this other stuff. So um, we spent a lot of time writing that up and trying to condense it because it couldn't be a book. You know, they're going to go, oh, my gosh, you know, not look at it. So it was like a two-page thing uh, with circles and arrows and a paragraph on each one explaining what each one was. If you're an analysis restaurant fan, you'll know what that was. Um, and and with the photos, you know, so uh, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, we did uh, uh, when it came. To, I, I tell you, the other thing that was funny about being on on with Zoom. Uh, there were a lot of us, and like even Darius was like going, "Okay, this is really weird." It's like he's looking at his computer. It's like ten people looking at him <laughs> while he's hooking this up. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I say you're in front of an audience all the time, but uh, but yeah, I mean that that was the deal because uh, we felt that uh, uh, with our involvement uh, there was a, there was a, some security there, you know that that we're not just throwing you out there on your own. Uh, have you never done this kind of stuff, you know? So yeah, and they don't have their crew there to you know. The, yeah, they're used to everybody doing it, right? I mean, I I'll, I won't say names, but there was one on one of these early shows. It wasn't one of one of ours, but it was one of the network shows with uh, the camera on a tripod, or maybe it was an iPhone or, or a smartphone, sitting on top of an upright piano, and the artist says something, you know, gives her introduction, and there's a window behind her, so she almost looked dark, and then when she did her song, the piano was so loud that you could barely hear both. And, uh, you know, because, you know, they don't know. And I, don't, I think maybe if the artist had maybe played it back, might have gone, hmm, maybe I should tweak this. I don't know. Or they didn't care. But I, from the ones I've seen, you know, that stuff's less and less now. I think people have really taken this like this is the new norm. And I think people, audiences, you know, are, are have been more forgiving. You know, because we're used to seeing this stuff now. And, they, and I think there's an understanding there. Because, you know, as long as the message is there, you know, and there's clarity enough to see and hear what's going on. Um, if it's a little lo-fi, 
you know, it is what it is. Yeah, it's genuine. You know, it's uh, it's people uh, doing doing what they can from doing their home. Right. Yeah. I mean, we had a piece from uh, Jason Aldean. Uh, didn't perform on this thing, but he did use he did use the MV88, I believe, for his speech. But he was at the beach, out on his balcony, didn't put the windsock on, and the surf and the wind noise was horrendous. Oh goodness. And I just went, you know, I said, I can filter it to a point, but, and they said, does he, we need to redo it? I said, that's your call. I mean, can you hear what he says? Yes. Does it sound pretty crappy? Yeah. Um, but again, he, you know, all he had to do is put the windsock on, or maybe just done it inside, you know, looking through the window at the beach. I don't know. So, but I, it's getting better. It's definitely getting better. Cause I, you know, I think here's the other thing is the whole work from home thing. Uh, even if even if this pandemic gets settled and we're all sort of quote unquote back to normal, I don't think this is going to go away. Everybody's gotten used to it now, right? We should have bought we should have bought stock in Zoom, right? <clears throat> but uh, it's really normal. I don't think it'll go away. I was just going to comment, Tom. A lot of the artists that I've been working with, you know, we've had this discussion about the fact that even though you know it should production houses or venues get back on their feet anytime you know soon whatever that means the reality is that the first run of shows that we're going to be doing is going to be either stuff that was canceled or postponed initially right or things that are being planned now and the things that are being planned now are being planned in this way because this is the environment we're working in so i think your your point is absolutely spot on this is not going away anytime soon we're going to we're developing new workflows that are going to be with us for the foreseeable future I think I think you're actually right, Jody. And 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 again, you know, as the as people get better at it, it's pretty easy. Hey, I don't have to get in my car and drive to a soundstage somewhere. Can I just do it here, at my house? I got I know how to do it. I'll just do that and then go, you know, jump in the pool with my kids. And I get that, you know, the whole work from home thing. Uh, we've embraced well, it's it. Also it's also a testament to the fact that a lot of the products that are on the market now, the technology that we have access to now is so much better than it was even 10 years ago or even five years ago, that it makes this kind of workflow uh, feasible in a way that that didn't used to be the case. And that's used to be the case. exciting. I think it's going to lead to more art, more good creative work being done in a way that wouldn't have happened before because people felt inhibited by the the, pre, the old style workflows, you know. I'll throw something out there real quick that's that's uh, off this talk but slightly, but it's I think it would be good for everybody to know about. Uh, NEP, uh, the largest remote uh, mobile truck facility in the country, I think they're the largest, pretty sure. Uh, they have a comp uh, an offshoot called Screenworks, <clears throat> which do the big LED screens for concerts and things. And they also have uh, an offshoot of that called Creative Technologies. And they, they have this, uh, 3D LED wall set thing with a floor that also has CGI stitching beyond the walls. They just set one up out at Skyway Studios, which is where my company is, Seismic Sound is. Uh, this thing is amazing. I mean, it's it, think of it as a green screen without a green screen. Um, and people are starting, again, it's just about this new technology. It looks amazing on camera. They can create any environment anywhere. And the artist or the talent can be up there and go, I'm in this place. I'm not looking at a green screen wall. And then they can stitch beyond it, uh, put a ceiling in it, uh, camera, the robotic cameras can spin around and see the, the whole 360 of the place. The reason I bring that up is that's technology that didn't exist a while back. And that's going to change the creative side of things. Anytime there's a, there's a jump in, in technology, uh, it opens up creative paths, right? And uh, and this is just another one in the video world that's going to happen. And, and the fact that they're using robotic cameras and things, uh, the crew can be very small. You know, it seems all software driven. So uh, same deal. I mean, this, like you said, Jerry, this technology has allowed us to do things that we couldn't do a few years ago. And, uh, and with the software and robust Internet and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a new world. Cool. Absolutely. All right, I'm, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Ben, who's going to jump into a conversation with the uh, wedge here. So thanks, Tom. Stick around, of course. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what what Mark Wedge has uh, been up to. Um, Mark, you've been doing the uh, the Good Morning America show lately, right? You find yourself in in the A1 seat there. 
Yeah. So uh, when all this happened, uh, you know, once things started getting locked down, you know, ABC was going with some personnel changes. Uh, they were, uh, you know, offering time off to their employees. Disney, ABC uh, was actually taking care of the people the way they need to be. And, and uh, congratulations to the company for doing that. Um, but the people who wanted time off got time off. Uh, and some of the people who wanted that were the regular mixers who wanted to take a little time with their family for their own personal reasons. And uh, so they turned to us, who may have been uh, mixing their summer concert series in Central Park for several years. Uh, you know, I've been involved with that show for, gosh, almost 16, 17 years. So uh, coming into the studio to mix, you know, the quote unquote big show. Uh, puts me in the chair. Um, and I've handled a lot of ABC special events before, so you know, I already had a good rapport with the producers, uh, directors, all the production personnel. So walking into that chair was a bit daunting, but, you know, we got to get a show up. And unfortunately, uh, you know, it's a daily show. We don't have a lot of time to get it up. And, uh, you know, that show is two hours of hang on by the seat of your pants and, you know, go. Uh, a lot of times we're getting correspondents who are coming in last minute. Uh, we have correspondents who are working from home now and have been for over 100 days. Uh, so one of our challenges was one, making sure that they have uh, the amenities that they're used to as our you know, chief anchors, um, but also integrating them into you know, relation shots. How do they relate to each other? It's one thing when you have you know, a team of five anchors who are used to working with each other in close proximity every morning. But it's another thing when you've got Robin Roberts on remote now and George at home on a remote. George coming down with the COVID symptoms, but actually uh, recovering just fine. Uh, it was interesting trying to integrate all that. And now to see in live shots on the set, social dis distancing, where we'll have three anchors on a set who are maintaining six feet apart. Uh, and uh, it's been interesting to see how, how all of that has evolved. And then where we might have had five or six remotes on a show and have a lot of uh, not filler content, but some lighter content, whether that's cooking segments, uh, musical performances live in the studio, or what we would used to do live in the park. We still have our summer concert series featuring performances every Friday. Uh, and we've gone similar to what Tom said. We've got uh, pre-recorded uh, packages. Sometimes we even have live packages, which we'll try to do a little more high end. In fact, one of our best ones we had for King and Country, I think, again, on SM7Bs, uh, came in great, sounded great. Uh, the problem that we're finding now is you never know what you're going to get. Uh, our ingest of remotes um, through our NAC, our Network Acquisition Center, uh, we call Master Control or Central Switching. We have a couple of uh, uh, workstations, uh, they're new tech workstations, that are handling our IP video with embedded HDSDI in, embedded HDSDI audio out. So it's catch as catch can. One moment we'll be talking to the, the winner of this month's greatest pet, uh, and another we're talking to Dr. Anthony Fauci. Um, and that might be a Zoom call, it might be FaceTime. You know, we have John Bon Jovi coming in for a performance via FaceTime. We'll have, uh, you know, wildly different audio coming in. And again, Going back to what Tom, Tom had said, really, it's a poor craftsman who blames his tools, but you need to be able to know how to use those tools in order to get the results. That you need. Um, so it's been interesting for us to figure out how to how to gauge a person's uh, technical abilities and technical capabilities to walk them through what's happening in their Zoom call or their Skype call or FaceTime, uh, and then to see if we can guide them in a very short time because we might have a three minute commercial break to make sure we have this person and they're solid. And of course, most of that time gets dedicated to making sure the shot looks good and there's not a window behind them and the lighting is okay. Uh, and we can see the pork tenderloin that they're cooking for us that day. Uh, so wow. you never know. Uh, so that's been the big troubles that we've had. You've got you've got um, a whole bunch of different types of uh, audio conference solutions and and microphones and everything and then you mentioned that at the at the home base on uh, 67th you have a like a workstation or aggregate that takes all that uh, all the different streams and kind of makes it into something that palatable that you can use or tangible that you can use so um, wow that's that's pretty interesting um, 
I was uh, I was curious how many uh, like the ratio is for the studio versus broadcasting at home. I mean, you you still mentioned that you do have some people coming into the studio, but it's uh, it's pretty limited, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we only have a few uh, anchors that come into the studio, um, and every week we hear, hey, maybe George is coming back, maybe he's not. But uh, we've had Amy Robach and Michael Strahan have been handling the broadcast uh, pretty much straight through from the beginning. Um, Robin Roberts has been at home. Uh, George Stephanopoulos has been at home. And Ginger Z has been at home. Uh, Lara Spencer has also been at home. So we've got, you know, four of our major talents, which are dealing with the delay, dealing with, you know, the technical limitations, and to their credit, have been absolute troopers in, in uh, uh, being a little more gentle about what we all do. Um, I think they all have a different appreciation for uh, what the A2s handle every day, what their cameramen deal with. It's really an interesting thing, and uh, hey, the Mark, talent has been fantastic about it. Tell, uh, tell our viewers a, a quick thing about how you have to deal with mixed minuses for these things. I think a lot of people would find it interesting. Sure. So, can. you know, it's really a um, mixed minus uh, for those of you coming into the broadcast world. Each of these remotes, and uh, again, historically on GMA, it's a two hour show. In our first half hour, it'll be a lot of remotes. We'll check in with correspondents who are, we'll see TJ Holmes on the street at Madison Square Garden. We may go to Matt Gutman in Los Angeles. We may uh, visit in with uh, Ian Panel in our London office. Uh, we may check in with Pierre Thomas in DC. All of these remotes will come in. We have uh, dedicated to us in audio about 16 paths for uh, remote slots between video and uh, telephone. Uh, but we have couplers for 12 of those remotes that are dedicated. And each remote has a dedicated uh, IFB line, uh, interruptible foldback, and a dedicated camera PF for a uh, camera coordination. So our talent, let's just say it's uh, Cecilia Vega coming in from, well, that might be a good one. We'll go into that in a second. <laughs> Some of these are actually fiber lines that are dedicated to our bureaus in Washington and Los Angeles. But anyway, everybody's got to hear everybody except for themselves. So mix minus wise, every single one of these remotes is receiving a mix of the show minus themselves. Uh, so dealing with that, uh, our actual console is a Calrec Apollo. So all of our remotes are being fed by multi-tracks. Some of them are boxes that feeds are getting on the floor for their internal phone acts and other IFBs on the floor. But again, dealing with people as we go throughout the show of taking things out, especially if we're repurposing things, because of course, we'd like to think that as you know, the largest media conglomerate in the world, you have infinite capabilities and infinite money. But unfortunately, those 12 paths that we have coming in for audio we only have six of those paths that can be color corrected and then put on air in our video switcher. So we take these 12 audio paths and we'll rotate through those, but video will rotate twice as fast as we will to get into color correctors for those paths. So sometimes we'll repurpose audio and we're like, ah, we're always popping people in and out if we need to. So keeping on top of that, there's myself uh, and an A1B and often we'll swap if we need to, but, uh, the um, historically a show that might have had five or six remotes at the top half hour of the show has turned into a 21 remote show in the span of two hours. Wow, thanks so much. Uh, we had our first question uh, related to this come in uh, kind of on the geeky side of things, but I think that's why we're all here. Uh, so they were asking about uh, about the real-time processing of the incoming audio and how it's handled before it's embedded into the video stream. I mean, uh, does it pass through a DAW or does it, how does it get resynced with the video before you know it goes on air? Interesting, the, uh, so our NAC, the way we do it is, obviously we have a lot of our regular incoming remote lines, which are, via satellite, via TVU, which is an IP um, video acquisition service, and also Live View, Live U, with uh, iPhones and iPads, that is another IP acquisition service. Those will all end up going into our network acquisition center. But for these Skype and Zoom and uh, FaceTime calls, we have these workstations that are basically set up. We dial them in once, 
to IFBs from the studio so that they get return video from the, uh, from the studio. It could be a wide shot. Sometimes they're actually not seeing anything, uh, depending on what's available in our northbound and southbound lines that day. But uh, the embedded audio is coming straight from our multi-tracks off the console. Uh, inbound is coming straight off the Zoom call. Uh, so that's really where the, the questions and uh, the big question mark is. Uh, we try to do test calls a couple days out if we know that a guest is going to be joining us ahead of time. Uh, and we can walk them through some of the things about, you know, preserving your original sound in a Zoom call or disabling AGC, automatic gain control, or echo cancellation uh, on Skype or uh, FaceTime. Actually, FaceTime, uh, the codec has actually been working out the best for us. It's a 16K lossy codec. It's actually AAC encoded uh, and has been fairly stable for us. But it was interesting. Uh, as a aside, we had a we had a so oh, it was a graduation. We had multiple Zoom calls where we had about forty or fifty people per call, and uh, we had uh, DJ D Nice was going to DJ the entire thing as another remote from Los Angeles. So you had a uh, one school coming in as a Zoom call, another school coming in as a Zoom call, and DJ D Nice DJing live throughout the whole thing. Uh, we had AB'd uh, a Skype call on it, and I said, look, just let your music roll, and we'll see what happens. And I'm like, it's skipping. You can hear the codec catching up and moving back and forth in time. And I was like, okay, can we try it with you know, a different option? FaceTime didn't seem to be doing that. But at the end of the day, it's what's available and what gets it on air. So uh, in the down and dirty world of news production, Okay, we're counting backwards from ten. We're going live. Hey, Mark, do you ever do you ever find yourself trying to chase dialing in delay at all? That just if Absolutely. it looks wacky and trying to pull it in. Soon? We have a an analog monitor right next to our console. Where we'll punch up video, and lip sync has always been an issue, um, and now is even more of an issue with everyone wearing masks. Uh, so we'll get uh, Actually easier. <laughs> Makes yeah, it easier. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> get, um, get a pass on that. Lately, what I've been doing in the in the workflow in the process, uh, if we get a chance to check in with a camera operator or an A2 in the morning, uh, we'll actually have them clap, see if we're in time, um, and we'll find it drifting. Sometimes we'll drift horribly. Uh, and another uh, caveat that I that snuck up on us: someone was using uh, Bluetooth earbuds and found those wandering in time with their the rest of their stuff. So it really, you need to be able to, and this goes back to Audio Basics 101, to understand every step of the signal chain is really key to be able to sort out one of these issues. Because when you check out somebody and then 20 minutes later you come back to them and wait a minute, I'm hearing you know room audio on your device microphone. Could you unplug your lightning connector, plug it back in, make sure that that microphone is you know, actually active on your device now. Um, that's one of the more frustrating things is that you really need to be on top of it and checking in with the talent routinely. And I like to do that anyway, because I think it's important to keep them involved with the show, especially with all of us working in a remote atmosphere. The more information you can get to your talent, the more you're going to get back from them. That's awesome. I, it's very interesting to me, especially about the FaceTime thing being some of the, the better codec and the better sound quality. And it's almost the, one of the most ubiquitous ones that everybody has. So, uh, you know, you really have to juggle a lot of these different codecs and be experienced with them and, and sample them, of course, nothing better than trying it out in order to, to actually hear. Um, one thing that was kind of curious about was um, you do have um, of your principal talent, you know, uh, Robin and George broadcasting from home. Uh, maybe you can kind of compare and contrast like kind of what their setup is. I mean, do they have a personnel there to help them with the camera and the audio and what that consists of versus, say, a special guest that just says, hey, we're going to have this guest on and and maybe they don't have a crew and kind of explain a little about that. Sure. Um, this might go into some of the the uh, union uh, issues uh, related to remote broadcasting, and that's a whole other discussion. But right now, none of these uh, none of these people have uh, full time support at home uh, in a technical sense. They do have uh, producers with them, so there is a, a producer 
who's handling a lot of their script, prompter, uh, stuff like that, making sure they have the things that they need for the broadcast. And a lot of them have gotten fantastic with the uh, technical capabilities. But for our primary anchors, um, we've got you know, a regular ENG news setup with a, you know, usually a Sony studio camera uh, or a Sony ENG camera. And that'll have an embedded microphone. So they have a real lav. Uh, they'll dial up. Uh, actually, some of our talent is on uh, regular dial up IFBs. So they'll put a telex squiggle in their, in their ear, just like I'm wearing right now. Um, and dial in on a cell phone uh, is very, very popular. We were having problems with one of our talent. Uh, that we decided to go in a different direction. It's actually using Peercom LQ to get to her. So she actually is always attached to the studio uh, via LQ intercom, which is an IP based uh, comms uh, solution. So the number of different things that we end up using uh, for each talent is specific to them. Uh, George was a trooper. He was doing his own lighting, his own uh, uh, video moving his own lights around and he would come in every day and set up and do his pre pre reads his tracking for the morning open. Uh, so I got to give our anchors a lot of credit for what they were doing. Uh, I know everybody's itching to get back to the studio. Uh, one particular person, she called out Andrew Hull, uh, one of our uh, EICs for our ABC production truck, called him out by name on air, said, I would not be able to do this without Andrew Hull's assistance had set up a huge 108 uh, inch monitor for her weather hits behind her uh, and really got her settled with her technology. Because she's monitoring the prompter, she's monitoring a weather map that's coming in. So all of these IP video feeds coming back to her in addition to her camera and outbound body. It's a lot for one person to do. That's very interesting. I mean, the, everybody's so involved in, you know, stepping outside their normal roles. Uh, I think that that's, goes without saying for all of us and everybody that's been working from home or in a different situation. It's uh, kind of learn and adapt. And, uh, you know, I've been learning more about video than I've ever had before. <laughs> and it's, it's, been, it's been great. Absolutely. Um, How many of us have become IT guys that we never expected to be, right? Wow. I, I, I don't want to interrupt your question, Jeff, but a lot of this goes back to something that Tom had touched on is that what we're finding is that the stories are out there. The message is out there, um, whether that's music production, whether that's news gathering, or any other kind of entertainment, infotainment. Uh, and the audience is there more than ever. People are craving content. Look at just who's here on this call. People are craving information and, and not only something to do, but something to spark their message. The rest of it, the the You've got input, you've got output. The only thing that's left is the transmission path, and that's a largely a technical function. And that's what everybody here on this call is good at. So it's up to us to raise that bar. Now, honestly, after the first couple of weeks of going into this uh, you know, lockdown, that bar got lowered pretty far on a lot of the things that we air. Uh, and we've constantly kept building that up saying, you know what, it's good for us to have a reminder that first and foremost is the message. And then if we can elevate the quality of that message, I think that's what all of us are here for. It's all about the content. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark, so much. Um, at this point, I think I'm going to turn it over to Jen, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about Jody's world and, and see what's going on there. Yeah, we're going to go back to uh, a little bit of music production. Uh, Jody's been super busy. I feel like every time I try to call you, um, you're going live with Yo-Yo Ma for something. <laughs> it's been so. a crazy busy time. <laughs> so, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you're working these days, um, particularly with uh, all the live streams and guest appearances that Yo-Yo Ma has been doing? Well, you, as you can imagine, he's an incredibly prolific guy and he he's also a great humanitarian and uh, he's very uh, proactive and from his, he's incredibly motivated to sort of get his message out there. It's all about what Wed was talking about, is connections, and it's about, you know, the, the the dialogue that we're having now, too, and on a lot of different platforms. And I just wanted to sort of follow up to some of what Wedge was saying just a minute ago about uh, uh, understanding the environment, and then also the sort of dip that we took at the beginning of this thing. I think that all of us in the professional, you know, end of the industry found ourselves discovering 
uh, we were learning a lot about the environment that we never paid attention to before as this, you know, as we were really rapidly discovering all the weaknesses uh, in these systems because we're using them in different ways. And that's been a really interesting learning curve over the past 12 weeks or so, uh, 12 to 16 weeks. So, uh, and that comes right into to talking about uh, sort of what I've been doing with Yo-Yo too. So much of what makes, uh, so, so much of what makes Yo-Yo very special is that he's a very tactile, uh, very engaged conversationalist, uh, not only about music, but about culture and about society and about all, all sorts of other things. And so central to his uh, sort of daily workflow is the ability to be very much in touch with people in a lot of different ways. And so um, we, you know, he's constantly doing interviews and uh, Zoom calls and appearing on panels, as well as doing, uh, we've done a whole series of hospital outreaches where we go into patients' rooms with Yo-Yo and a doctor, and he plays for patients that are recovering and things like this. And it's all very much real time, and it's all straight from his, you know, he's been in lockdown in his house the whole time, very very, um, very deeply committed lockdown. Nobody's been in or out of his house at all uh, for, for weeks and weeks. And um, so uh, it's been a challenge to sort of work around these uh, workflow, you know, obstacles that we <laughs> never had to think about before. You know, six months ago, it would have been, ah, send six guys up there and set up a system and it'll be great. But now I have to figure out how to do it uh, by just sending him a kit that he can put together himself. And I have the most respect for Yo-Yo in the world, but he is not a particularly technical guy. He's really good at what he, he's really good at being Yo-Yo, but he doesn't know one mic from another or whatever, and nor should he need to. It's not his gig, you know? Uh, but uh, going back to what Tom was saying about prepping um, uh, little document packages to go out with the equipment, I've been doing a lot of the same things for a lot of the different kinds of things that I've been doing. A little binder that includes photos and step-by-step -step instructions and, and how-to guides. In my case, I'll even go so far as I, I have the most extraordinary stack of rainbow-colored electrical tape now, and every single wire is color-coded at the wire end and at the destination on the device. And it doesn't matter if it's a power cable into a computer that probably everybody's seen. Every single cable is self-explanatory. And I've what been able to- somebody's colorblind, though? Then what do you I haven't do? encountered that yet. I'd, I'd work with shades of blue, I guess. <laughs> um, but well, you know, you know what I would do, Tom? I would number it. One goes to one, two goes to two, three goes to three, and continue on down the path. There's a solution for everything, right? And the more that we can make the users comfortable, uh, the the easier the job's going to be, and they're going to not be stressed about having to put together the stuff that they don't understand. All they need to do is get it assembled. And so to your question, that's the very first thing I did with Yo-Yo. I put together a kit um, for him that included a bunch of different kinds of microphones for different applications, um, a, a little multi-channel audio interface, and a computer, color-coded everything so that he could get in and out of it, hardwire connection into his Ethernet port on the, on his you know home router. Uh, and to be honest with you, the, I sent the kit up there, and by the time I got on the phone with him, he already had it completely assembled. Right. And with one one small mistake, that was a mistake that anybody would have made. We talked him right through it and we were up and running. And the way I've been working with him is that I've, I've set that computer up so that I can use a, a remote access uh, software called TeamViewer, which is very much like screen sharing um, on a Zoom call. Or if people aren't familiar with that, if people are, if you want a sort of industrial grade uh, remote control of a computer, um, use check out team viewer because it's kind of the best out there. And so what I'll do when we have a session is I'll team viewer into Yo-Yo's, into the computer that's sitting in his studio or in his office at his house with all the microphones set up around him. And then there's there's Pro Tools HD installed on that system. And all the, all the audio IO is right there next to him. And I can control that session remotely. And all I'm doing is monitoring it at my location on, on this end. And so we can do things like uh, overdubs, punch-ins with him because the audio stays local to his studio. And then um, when it's done, I take the files off of his, off of that computer, drop them in a Dropbox. About 10 minutes later, they show up in my computer in my, my house in upstate New York, and I can do post-production on them here or whatever and ship them out to the world. So that's how we've been doing a bunch of different kinds of collaborations. I've also got, uh, I'm using a software program called Loopback. I don't know if anybody's familiar with loopback. It's basically a way to move audio directly between applications. So say for instance, I can use loopback to hijack the output of Pro Tools from Yo-Yo's uh, computer and feed it directly into a Zoom meeting. 
So when we're doing Zoom calls or panel conferences, he can talk on his dialogue mic in real time to the Zoom call. And then in real time, I can use Pro Tools remotely to turn that mic down and turn up the cello mic. So we get a real time mix that's going directly to the Zoom meeting. And the fidelity is really quite good. Um, I, I think, I, Jen, I sent you a couple of things that we could talk about if you want. Uh, and this relates to some of the other work I'm doing too. So maybe this is a good time to bring it up. There are some ways, uh, Tom or Mark, one of you was talking about different, uh, you, someone was mentioning uh, FaceTime as a reasonably good audio codec. Um, I don't remember, I just wanted to give props, but uh, Zoom actually is capable of uh, passing full quality audio through the meeting if you know how to manipulate it. I sent you a couple of screenshots that might be helpful for yeah, some of our- Yeah, let, uh, let me go ahead and pull those up. Okay, so just to sort of throw this out there, if you're using Zoom and you wanna pass good quality audio, there are a couple things you need to do. And the first thing you need to do is go into your Zoom account, not the preferences in the app itself, but actually into your, your online access to your Zoom account. And you'll see where I've got those green arrows set up there. Uh, you go first to your in-meeting advanced settings, and then there are two things you wanna switch on. Uh, they're right next to each other in your preferences. One is us allows users to select stereo audio, and the second is allow users to select original sound in their client settings. So you switch those on in, in the account that's hosting the Zoom call. And so if you wanna use these and somebody else is the administrator of the call, you need to encourage them to get these settings turned on because that's those settings are central to the host of the Zoom, no matter how many people are on it. So then do you have that next uh, slide? Yeah. So then at the point of origin of the uh, audio source, oh, there you go, nicely done. Uh, you want to do a couple things. Uh, you go to your audio preferences. Now, this is in the Zoom app. You want to go to your audio preferences and turn on, uh, well, once you've done the administrator level, allow users to enable stereo, you'll see that little enable stereo checkbox appear. So that uh, allows you to get a stereo signal in. And then you want to click that advanced tab, which you sometimes have to scroll all the way to the bottom of the, the uh, uh, audio preferences page to get to that advanced tab. And the next, uh, the right frame that you see that Jen's put up is the uh, is the advanced tab, uh, the advanced preferences tab. And that's where you'll see a checkbox that says show in meeting option to enable original sound from microphone. If you check that, and then also under uh, uh, the two drop down menus, you can disable persistent background noise and intermittent background noise. And by doing those things, it essentially turns off all of the automatic compression and gating that Zoom does in the context of a meeting. And let's face it, for dialogue only Zoom meetings, Zoom is very, very good at suppressing background noise and auto switching between whoever's speaking. It's, it's an exceptionally uh, nimble tool. But for music, it kind of stinks unless you do this stuff. But if you do this and use something like Loopback, which allows you to patch right from whatever DAW you're using, you can get full quality uncompressed audio straight into a Zoom broadcast, and it's really very good. Um, you wanna show that next page? Uh, sorry, Tom, what's up? Go ahead, I was just gonna comment on it, but finish. So yeah, I, I did this too. Um, when, you, when you've done those things and you go back to your Zoom meeting, you'll see that new button at the top of the screen that says turn off original sound. It's a little bit counterintuitive because you want it to display turn off original sound. It basically acts like a light switch. So the, the switch is either on or it's off. And if original sound is on, you have the option to turn it off. If the original sound is off, that'll display turn on original sound. So you want original sound to be running if you're trying to get music into a Zoom meeting in this way. Uh, but it's very effective. So I was going to jump in, Jody, as far as this whole everybody working by remote, uh, <clears throat> When, when I was finishing some of these CMT shows, Viacom networks, for all their networks, of which CMT is one, has really been very, very uh, careful with their employees and they don't want them going to other facilities. So we did uh, these last couple of shows I did with them, we did with either Zoom or uh, there's a there's a high-end one called Evercast, which, uh, which you guys have probably seen. Uh, so all of my clients didn't even come to my studio, but I was able to feed my real time mix and did a screen share or something to get the video that I was tracking that I was using because it was a post TV show. And it was really great, you know, because they were just mute. I had it coming back into my console so I could hear them if they unmuted. 
and say, hey, maybe that bumper music could be a little louder. Okay, fine, let's do that. And it was actually kind of pretty, it was pretty good. I was nervous about the first time I did it. I said, no, this is kind of okay. Yeah. Kind of yep. I've done stuff with uh, CNN, uh, BBC, a uh, bunch of different things with Yo-Yo. And, and invariably, the producers will send me a little email or a text afterwards saying, that was the best sounding segment we've had. And, you know, it's about just getting the good source material as far down the path as you can get it, you know. It, it, have you been exclusively using Zoom? For these no. Uh, in fact, a lot of times we're on whatever platform uh, is the, the host is using. Uh, we'll, a lot of the news organizations, we're seeing a lot of Cisco WebEx uh, uh, stuff. Uh, we've done FaceTime. We've done Skype. Skype is kind of the hardest in terms of other devices getting into it and stuff. It's not as elegant as some of the others, uh, but still works uh, in the same way. And, uh, uh, and a, a lot of Zoom. A lot of people are using Zoom. Yeah. Cool. Um Moving on from that, I, I'm very curious about your workflow for the bang on a can, because uh, Jody's been doing a, a marathon of a music festival, all live streamed uh, with all these different artists in, in various locations. Um, so can we talk sure. about that a little bit? Yeah, Bang on a Can is a new music organization that's been around for decades, uh, fostering uh, contemporary composition, chamber music, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of contemporary classical music, and if that's the easiest way to describe. But it's really, they embrace music from every genre, uh, from all cultures. It's a really open-minded music organization. And one of their signature events right from the beginning has been what they call these marathon concerts. And the marathon concerts uh, are typically not less than six hours long and, and often have been as much as 12 hours. We'll go from noon to midnight or 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. in different places. And it's always free to the public. And they post the schedule of who's going to be performing which pieces or when. And people are encouraged to come and go. And it's a way to, to uh, encourage and foster new compositions as well as to get people interested in seeing you know, music that they might not otherwise encounter in a more public, uh, a more commercial format. Um, so, of course, in the light of the lockdown, they said, well, you know, can we do one of these marathon concerts virtually? And so we put our brains together and what we came up with, uh, we've done two of them now. And in each case, they've been six hours long, roughly 30 artists, all live, really live, no playback, uh, no playback video at all, uh, and nonstop for six hours straight. And so what we came up with is a way to, uh, we're actually uh, simultaneously hosting two different Zoom meetings on two different accounts. And in one Zoom meeting is where all the artists come to perform. And in the second Zoom meeting is where the composers and the founders of Bang on a Can are able to have a little chat. And so what it allows me to do is the artists basically all enter the Zoom meeting, uh, the artist Zoom meeting, but I keep them in the waiting room. So there's a big queue of people that are about to perform. Most of the performances are under 10 minutes long. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty rapidly moving rotation. People come on, do one piece, and then they're out. But that Zoom meeting I'm administering, I'm off screen, you don't see me, but uh, the I can let just one artist in, spotlight them full screen, and then there's no danger of anybody accidentally interrupting the broadcast or anything else uh, while their performance is happening. And then I've got a physical video switcher. I'm taking the output of each Zoom meeting from uh, each computer, feeding into a vis physical video switcher so that I can switch between the outputs of the two computers output that video switcher into a third computer that's doing the encoding for streaming. And so when one artist is done, we've worked out a very simple little queuing system because some of the pieces are improvised too. And if you've got an improvised piece, you don't always necessarily know when the end is coming up, right? And so um, we've encouraged all of the artists at the end of their performance to actually on screen take a bow. And then that gives me a, a visual cue that they're absolutely <laughs> done with their performance. And then I, I warn the hosts and I switch the video switcher back over to the host computer, make them live. And then they're having a conversation much like we're having. And what that basically does is it covers the stage change. So they can chat for three or four minutes with the composer of the previous piece while I'm back over on the other Zoom meeting, which is now offline, uh, talking to the next artist in, in let, who's been let in from the waiting room, making sure their audio sounds good and everything else, making sure they're full screen. And when they're ready, I worked out a queuing system with the host and say, okay, we're, we're ready on the, on the performance side. And then they'll say, okay, now we're going to Chicago to our next artist, throw the video switcher back again. And then the artist, artist gets to perform. And we basically just bounce back and forth like that for six hours straight. And 
in most cases, there's been a lot of preparation with the artists themselves leading up to the actual day of the show, where I'm talking about a lot of things that Tom and Wedge have been talking about, about making sure their microphone connectivity is right and that their DAWs are feeding into Zoom well. And, you know, and because we're working with such a cross section of artists, some of them have quite a bit of technical knowledge and some of them have very, very little technical knowledge at all. And so in some cases, we've had to send them microphones or, you know, help them sort of figure out how to plug an ethernet cable into their router and things like that. So there's an awful lot of work that goes into the preparation for that six hour event. But the ones that we've done have worked pretty smoothly. The people are on board and putting in the effort and, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So. Awesome. I'm Jody, really if I can, I want to interrupt and, and this, Tom, you can weigh in on this too. What I'm finding is a common theme going throughout all this is that all of our documentation has had to get a lot better. Um, whether that's paper documentation to send out to people, I've been a big fan, I've been making Google Docs and Google Sheets that are documenting everything that we've been doing to just oh, yeah. have information available to everyone. Yeah, we send out really, uh, really detailed, but not too extensive too. You gotta walk that fine line between making sure you hit the relevant information, but also not overwhelming right. people with information because that's a really quick way to say, well, you know, maybe I just won't be a part of this event. It's too much trouble. <laughs> yeah, know? what I discovered really quickly is I had to re reset my, my uh, approach a little bit, realizing that if I'm gonna prep a doc or a spreadsheet or something for what we're doing, if I send it to Jody or Wedge, that's easy because they know exactly what I'm talking about. If I'm going to send it to Miranda Lambert, uh, is she going to know what this means? <laughs> so you really well, have to change. Yeah. Right. That's Which why I went to Jody's red into route. red. Yeah. That's why I went the color coding route because I can't even talk about what an XLR cable is to a lot of these people. Yeah. Right. It doesn't mean anything to them, but they know they can plug the red cable into the red receptacle and that's, that it gets the job done. This is not an RF microphone. <laughs> like that. yeah, that's it for my I, love it. I love it you know what else has been interesting from my point of view too is that it's a it's been a real sort of reality check uh i think wedge you were talking about um someone on air mentioning their uh how much they've come to appreciate their technical assistant in in that uh, uh circumstance right uh, and in some cases, our talent is starting to have a greater understanding of what we're doing, right? But it also has been, been really uh, interesting for me to observe how much I take for granted through this whole mm -hmm. process, right? We get into our own sort of workflow, and you realize that on any given day, on a, a, a typical production, there are a thousand decisions that we don't ever have to think about because we take them for granted. And now you got to go back and reconsider every one of those because one of them is going to be really important and you it's, you can't take it for granted anymore. You know, you got to cover every base uh, from every connection all the way through, uh, all the way through. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we're actually at an hour <laughs> already. Uh, so we're going to bring Jason in. We have a few questions that have come in uh, up, guys? from the people who have been tuning this was in. Like Drinking from a fire hose a little bit here. You guys are a wealth of information on this topic. So thank you guys. We've had quite a few comments as well of people saying thank you and, and they've appreciated this information quite a bit. Um, just a few questions from the field we want to get to here before we close things out. Um, thank you guys for staying. Uh, Wedge, we had one that came in earlier from you for you um, from Joe Firiolo. He asks... Uh, I was extremely impressed with the way ABC handled the remote vodcast for American Idol during quarantine. And I don't know if you had anything to do with this, but he's he's basically asking if you can explain a little on how the audio was handled and how the video codec was used. Do we know if it was Zoom, Cisco, Polycom? Um, do you have any idea of the backbone of that uh, production? Honestly, I can't speak to it because it was a totally different crew and a totally different production team that came out of our, our West Coast offices. So I can't speak to it, unfortunately. Yeah, I think I think we might be able to to ping some people on that one and get some answers for that, Joe. Maybe we can fire that to you later on. Uh, but great question. Thanks for being honest there, Wedge. Um, cool. Uh, let's see. Next up here, we had we talked a little bit about this, and Jody, I know you mentioned you use some multiple platforms, and we had a specific question about if you had any 
any specific settings while using WebEx um, to create better audio in that, somewhat similar to the Zoom settings. Um, if you had created a workflow in WebEx or if that had, had as much um, ability to change the audio as Zoom does, as we demonstrated here. Um, I, I, uh, the short answer is I don't know. Um, because okay. every time I've used WebEx, I've been on somebody else's administered meeting. So I don't have an administrator account on WebEx myself. Um, I do know that it allows me to choose the input sources for the audio in the same way that Zoom and, and all the others do. So I've been able to um, get my uh, sort of live mix of Yo-Yo straight into the WebEx broadcasts, and they tend to be uh, they tend to be pretty pleased with what I'm sending them. Uh, it also is worth mentioning that every time I've been on WebEx, it's been with a legit news operation that has uh, you know we're feeding into a studio with a with a, a, a an experienced operator on the other end too. So uh, I, I can't say how much has gone on on their end to prepare for the stream that I'm sending them, although I suspect it's been uh, pretty well managed in most cases. I'm sure they've got some tools that they've pulled out for that as well. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, I guess, let's see, one more that came through here. Does We, we talked about this program Loopback um, that was used earlier. Have any of you guys used Loopback with GoToMeeting? Um, which is the platform that we're on right now. We have not. Um, I don't know, Ben, I don't think, I know you had put the link in the chat, I believe. None of us have used that for GoToMeeting. Have you guys had any success with Loopback on a GoToMeeting platform? Or do you know what platforms it's available to to patch into? Well, it, it's not platform specific. I can speak to that because I use this thing a lot. Uh, okay. I haven't used it specifically with GoToMeeting, but I have a, I have no reason to think that it wouldn't work as well with anything else. Uh, just really quickly, and not to make too much of a product plug for it, although I do like it, it works really well. Um, Loopback is a standalone audio uh, application. It's just a piece of software that sits right next to your you know, word processor in your applications folder, right? So you launch Loopback, and then it gives you the ability to define sources and destinations as audio paths, and literally like drag little patch tables between them. And so it'll allow you to get from any audio, any application that generates audio, you know, could be your web browser and a YouTube video, or it could be a DAW of any flavor at all, uh, and going to any application that will receive audio, like Zoom or GoToMeeting or FaceTime or anything. Uh, and you basically just choose loopback as your audio source instead of your built-in microphone, and assuming that your your microphone, your audio source is is allocated in in loopback to be your your origin material. Uh, I don't see why it wouldn't work. It's pretty nimble in that respect, and it's uh, it works great. It's a great utility. Awesome, awesome, uh, Jody. We had one question here about uh, the festival you're working on. Um, uh, What's the typical viewership? Do you know of those that music festival you're working on? Uh, Bang Just numbers. Camp. Yeah, about twenty thousand. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, and it's not twenty thousand people watching all six hours, but we'll get around right. twenty thousand unique viewers over the course of the six hours from countries all over the world, forty, fifty, sixty different countries tune into this thing. Uh, so yeah, awesome. And I thought our. Uh, 100 plus on this thing was was knocking it out of the park. No, that's awesome. Fantastic. Um, and again, like I mentioned, they'll post when certain performers are playing certain pieces by certain composers. Right. And some people will just come on to see a piece by the uh, composer that they like or by the performer that they're interested in or something. Uh, some people do actually stick around for all six hours. Uh, but we get a lot of people coming and going. People watch for an hour. People watch for 15 minutes or whatever. But yeah. Quarantine Jody, I just condition. want to jump in and talk about your experience with Loopback. Uh, not to keep beating that horse, but have you dabbled with Jack or um, Soundflower or any? Same other? Thing. Yeah, same same, same thing. Idea. Loopback's a kinder, gentler application wrapper, but it's all it's exactly the same kind of functionality. Uh, you know, we were talking before about not overwhelming people with information. Like sure. getting Soundflower these days is kind of a rough yeah. ride because it's not really supported as a commercial app anymore loopback is it's very easy to get it's very easy to use and so but yeah it's, it's exactly the same functionality cool awesome uh just a couple more coming here at the end um is anybody using dante via for a live back backbone platform no 
I've messed around with it a bit, but haven't found it to be as useful as my other workflows. Um, but it's a great it's a great product. I mean, we are all finding. I, I think all of us have touched on this in different ways. We're finding new ways to work, and that means finding tools that are going to work in the specific situations that we find ourselves in. And the situations that I find myself in are very different than what Wedge deals with on a daily basis, and different than the kinds of things that Tom's been working on recently. And so, there, you know, Dante V is going to be exactly the right thing for somebody in a different situation. And it's going to be great because it's a great tool. I did have a friend who was uh, uh, doing some college professor work that I had lent a DM1000 to with a Dante card in it. And he said that worked out great for his particular workflow. Yeah. He was able to have a microphone and have everything physical faders there and just take his Zoom straight off of his uh, Dante. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for somebody who's on a completely uh, Dante enabled environment, it's going to be it's going to be absolutely the right thing. Awesome. Um, one more came in here about uh, I, it just says mic sanitation methods and equipment question mark. And I don't know what you guys are, how much you're dealing with that as far as you're kind of being separated from the end user and what they're using. But if you want to maybe talk just a bit about your current workflow on on what you're doing. <laughs> uh, Every time I pack to- up one of these kits, it gets completely sanitized, uh, you know, either alcohol or, or a little mild bleach solution before it gets sealed up. And I include a box of uh, alcohol wipes in the kit so that it can be sanitized before it goes back in the world. Yeah, that's basically it. You just have it all wiped down <clears throat> and put the little packets in there. Yeah. We go through tons of 99% alcohol, and that has been, you know, the least amount of wear on the gear, and everything seems to be holding up pretty well. Awesome. Uh, last one. Hey guys, I'm I'm a local New York one stagehand. I'm concerned about how much work there will be going forward with the new norm. Do you think there'll be significant work for us as stagehands moving forward? It's kind of a tough one to uh, <laughs> to try to tell the future. I'm not gonna guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think everybody's like, in the same boat. like listen, like everybody's been like Wedge said very clearly before. People are gonna make content. People are gonna consume content. We're finding new ways to do it, right? Beyond that, I don't know. I mean, there's going to be work being made, certainly, and a lot of that work will need support, technical support. Um, but I think we got to be proactive about uh, ad- adapting and persevering. <laughs> well, you know, as the as the you know experts keep saying, you know, uh, rem- drug therapies and vaccines could change all of this and get us back to a point. But there'll be another one. <laughs> you know, it's just we've dodged yeah. a bullet for many years. Uh, so this is a bit of a wake up call. Hopefully, uh, if they come out with, you know, some drug therapies and, and vaccines that, that really eradicate this thing as they've had, as they've done in the past with like smallpox, the big ones, uh, and rubella, things like that. So I think we could see a lot of this kick back in, but for how long? You know, I don't know. It's tough to say. Well, and as we were saying before, too, people are finding new ways to work and, and that's becoming the, the new standards, you know. Yep. So maybe we'll never get back to 100 percent capacity the way we were six, eight months ago. Uh, but we're going to be doing new work in new ways. So find ways to support that for sure. Yeah, and is it, isn't that what always happens with technology? You know, they always say, oh, technology is going to take jobs, but take, it's going to take away jobs. It actually <laughs> does the opposite. It creates yep. Right. I think, I think one of the unique things as I look at this entire panel of people is that you I've seen all of you in many different situations. And I think our flexibility is part of that, you know, our willingness to learn new things. Um, you know, I think the more important things we should be concentrating on going ahead is continuing to learn about the new technologies and how they can help us, and how we can help the productions do what they need to do. And then we're going to continue to learn whether we're, you know, on the IA call or on an IBEW call or on a NABIT call uh, or just working from our home. And, uh, and, have, and having multiple skill sets, <clears throat> Wedge, you're a perfect example of that. You know, I mean, I've known Wedge for, for years. He, he's an A1. He's a, a music composer, producer. He's a playback guy. He can do front of house mix. He can do monitors. So there's always a place for Wedge to get a job somewhere because he can fill so many roles. And what's great about that with, with someone like him too is 
he may be doing this job on this gig, but he understands your job and your job and your job as well. So he can help facilitate needs and things. So I think it's important just to expand your horizons as much as you can. It's a big one. Yeah. There's also a, there's also a thing that we often fall into, which is like, oh, I I need to know all about this new technology, or I need to you know do a deep dive on this thing over here. I think what this is offering us is an opportunity to kind of do a deep dive in ourselves. <laughs> you know, wow. like examine yourself, examine what you're capable of, how you can be flexible, how you can change your concept of what it is that you do and how you do it. Because, you know, there's a, a good friend of mine is a, a production manager. We work together on a bunch of different things over the years. And we were having a conversation one day about, you know, a lot of people get into our industry when they're very young and you don't see them sticking around for very long because they either decide that it's not for them or whatever reason. But those of us who really become sort of lifers in this thing, all are possessed of two characteristics. And one of them is adaptability and the other is perseverance, you know, because nothing ever works the way you think it's going to work ever. Have any of you ever been on a gig where it worked exactly the way you thought it was going to work? <laughs> nope. And and this is you know this is maybe maybe an extreme example of that what we're all going through as a country and as a society and as an industry right now uh, that this is not working the way we thought it was going to be working six months ago but you know what we got to persevere and adapt and it'll be fine <laughs> so I'll tell you a quick little funny anecdote about that I I was the uh, production mixer on uh, Nashville Star uh, which was done here in, in, for five years uh, great crew. Fun little show. It was on a &E, then it went to NBC. But five years, I had this decided that I was going to, because, you know, we all we all write up our tech specs, you know, and our, our malt schedules and all this. And then you're on site scribbling, oh, we're changing this, changing that. Da, da. And I had this thing is I'm going to implement all my changes into my master Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to see if I can get it to the point where we come back for the next season or sometimes the truck and the stage would break down and come back. See if I can get it to the point where we never have to pencil anything because it's perfect. It just became a silly thing I tried to do. In five seasons, I never got there. <laughs> yep. It still and you never will. You know, scribbled stuff in there. Yeah. I, yeah. Can't do it. Adapt, adapt, adapt. Awesome. Um, one more question for Jody that came in here late, and that was earlier you had mentioned that you were giving some technical tips to your artists. Um, can you go over just maybe a couple of those technical tips or what you're specifically giving to those artists to get them up to a base level um, as you as you work on this remote workflow? Well, again, I uh, I think it's uh, hmm, technical tips. My technical tips are are uh, masquerading as just helpful guidelines, right? Because not one of the artists that I talk to is interested in the difference between a cardioid microphone and an omni microphone, <laughs> right? Like you can't have that conversation because they glaze over and then you've lost their interest, right? And I don't need them to understand the difference in, in most cases. And so, you know, my technical tips might be, ah, you know, I wonder if you could just pull that microphone a little closer to your piano. Or, you know, oh, yeah, you know, that light, that, that window behind you is really bright. Can you close that? It might make you look a little better on camera. You know, it's, it's, I'm trying to think about how to not intimidating, intimidate them with a bunch of technical uh, uh, language that's, that they're not, exactly, that they're not going to understand. I mean, I can have that kind of conversation with everybody on this call. Right. But we're, our interests are different and we're here to, I feel like I'm here to serve the artists. I want to make the environment as comfortable as possible so that the artist can get on with being an artist, right? Their job is to make music. I want to give them an environment where it's comfortable for them to make music in, whatever that means, whether it's a remote recording session or a live concert or a recording studio or a, a, a radio broadcast studio or whatever. It doesn't matter. And and the, uh, the things that we need to do in each of those situations may be different based on the, the day, the space, or the artist. Right. So there's a real value in understanding where, what your artist's uh, threshold is for, for moving the micro microphone around or not, you know, and trying to find that sweet spot in there. So uh, I'm not going to I'm going to deny your your questioner any specific <laughs> because there aren't specifics. It's unique. To Adapt. Yeah. But, you know, Wedged, think about how many quick I as think, possible. Yeah. To build on what Jody's saying, he's absolutely right. And, and to distill it down to its essence. You got to pick your battles. Um, the story that I've got, you know, we have one 
of our, not our regular talent, but uh, they've been a regular on the show and no names will be named for it. But every time I'm looking, the microphone just isn't dressed neatly. And I, I was actually talking to them and I said, do me a favor. I see you right on your computer. You're there in the call. Just Google the phrase newsman's loop. Help me out. And just help me out with getting that loop just the way it needs to be to dress the cable. Not interested at all. They're like, yeah, I'm not. So you got to pick your battles. And you got to know when to let it go, too. Sometimes you're not going to get the perfect audio. You're not going to get the audio you know you could get if you were able to go and position things yourself or whatever. But the reality is that the, the gig's still going to get done, and you're going to work with it, and you're going to make it as good as it can be in these in, in this environment. You know, I, I worked on the. So I worked at a Democratic National Convention for MSNBC, which was so out of my wheelhouse. It was the weirdest thing that they were desperate. They couldn't find somebody. And uh, Chuck Todd, uh, if you know who he is, good guy, usually funny, but he is so engrossed. And we're getting ready to go on the air. He's got his earpiece in, he's mic'd up, and he's he's working on something. <clears throat> and then I hit his IFB. He go, Chuck, just checking, you got me? And all I get is, mm. <laughs> Chuck, uh, can you just say Tom? He goes, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know what mm, means. <laughs> it was funny. All right. That's it. Well, uh, I think that does it for our question category over here from the uh, from the group. A ton of thank yous and excellent webinar and appreciate the information from the group. Um, and I know our team feels the same. So uh, Wedge, Jody, Tom, thank you guys so much for being here. This was uh, informative for me and many others as well. One quick note, the Zoom um, settings that we talked about earlier, just so you guys know, do require a paid account. Um, so yes, if, you are on a free, Sorry. Yeah. if you're on a free account, um, you're not going to be able to access some of those settings. So if you're trying to do that later and you, you run into a hurdle, that, that's probably why. Um, as moving forward with a little bit of housekeeping, our uh, Tuesday Tech Talks and our Friday webinars are taking a break next week. Uh, we usually have a, a Tuesday Tech Talks are the first and third of the month. Uh, first and third Tuesday of the month, excuse me. Uh, we have a five-week month here in June, so we are taking uh, next Tuesday off, and we will be back on the 7th of July. And next week is July 3rd, which is a sure holiday for us to have the 4th off, so we will be taking a break from our Friday webinars. We will be uh, resuming on uh, July 10th with a RF webinar about antenna placement and system design. So stay tuned for some more information on that. Um, to all of our guests, thank you guys for being here. Jen, Ryan, Ben, everybody from Sure, uh, Nick, thank you guys for putting this together. And again, Wedge, Jody, and Tom, you guys were fantastic. And we really, really appreciate your time. And I, I know everybody else does as well. Happy to so, be here. Happy to be a part of it. Yeah. With yeah, that, thank you. you guys yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Brought some old friends together. Yep. It's, uh, it's a small circle. All right, guys. Hey, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you guys again for being here. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.